if anything, then history has shown us that in any crisis, whether that's the financial crash in 2008 or the dot-com crash, you know, 1999, 2000, that companies that kept investing in culture and in innovation and actually made big leaps, you know, Google, to name one company that famously rose and emerged from the dot-com crash more resilient and was stronger than before because it kept investing in, in new products and Apple did as well. So I think there's something to be said from an economic, from a business perspective, not to just completely go back to this reductionist view and be super pragmatically focused on the bottom line, but actually no, continue with a much broader view of business. Um, but I think there is a real tension now and there's going to be a real struggle. Um, so some of those, um, fundamental um, market forces they're going to be I think reinforced and they're going to uh, see new support and for a more humanist way of doing business uh, in in the spirit of for example the, the CEO roundtable statement that came out last year and many companies changing their mission statements and changing the way they operate um, it's I think they, they have to stick with their uh, stick with their path so uh, it's either a back to the basics or it's a real, it's a license to reinvent business from the ground up, which I hope is, is the path that we'll take. Tim Lieberich is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Tim is a German-American author, entrepreneur, and the co-founder and co-CEO of the Business Romantic Society, a firm that helps organizations and individuals create transformative vision, stories, and experiences. Tim is also the co-founder and curator of the House of Beautiful Business, a global think tank and community with an annual gathering in Lisbon that brings together leaders and change makers with the mission to humanize business in the age of machines. Previously, Tim served as the chief marketing officer of NBBJ, a global design and architecture firm. From 2006 to 2013, he was the chief marketing officer of product design and innovation consultancy, Frog Design. His TED Talks are so wonderful. Three ways to usefully lose control of your brand, and most recently, four ways to build a human company in the age of machines. Having been viewed well over 2.5 million times to date, Tim is the author of the book, The Business Romantic, Harper Collins, which has been translated into nine languages to date. Tim's writing regularly appears in publications such as Entrepreneur, Fast Company, Forbes, Fortune, Harvard Business Review, Courts, Psychology Today, and Wired. His new book, The End of Winning, Why the Future Belongs to Losers, will be released in hopefully in May or probably pushed back because of the pandemic, but his German version is coming out soon. I actually launches on Thursday, if I understood him correct. My translation of the German into English would be win against dictatorships, how to lose without being a loser. But I'm sure he's going to correct me and help me make sure I've got the, the book and everything correct. Welcome, Tim. It's so good to see you. Thanks, Mark. Wonderful to see you too. And thanks for having me on. And gosh, this uh, long <laughs> bio reminded me of how old I am. <laughs> yeah, and I, I took the shorter version, but I, I, I don't, it has, for, in my mind, it has absolutely nothing to do with how old you are. You've been on a mission, passionate, dedicated to have some pretty big, hairy, and audacious goals and achievements for the future of work and how we work and, and um, how we look at big topics in our world, uh, which is always something that has a long list of accomplishments and, and things to do. So by no means are you old. Uh, I'm probably date you a, a lot more because of my grandchildren and all the gray hair I have as I'm well. Not there but yet, I, yeah. I, I, don't, not yet. <laughs> I don't have all, all the great accomplishments that you do. 
um, before we, we dive in and get the explanation on your books, I, I, I believe, and I want to ask you that you have had uh, years of experience to know how to be resilient, how to design, how to think in different ways, how to apply the, the, the theme, the topics, the, the ways of working in as a business romantic, um, which is a form of resilience. Has that helped you at all to weather this pandemic? How have you been and how have you gotten through this period? Um, could you kind of get us up to speed and tell us how you've been and if, if you've seen some positive things come out of it because of your pre-learnings or experiences or trials, the way you've set up your life? I, I have been really lucky, I have to say, during this pandemic to be really privileged in a very privileged position. I mean, first of all, to be in a family, you know, we have one daughter, my, my wife, we live together. So it's, it's much easier, I think, in many ways than to be alone, live alone, be uh, older. For example, my father is really not been really well, you know, he lives alone and, uh, and was really hit hard uh, by, by the pandemic. And, and then of course, then I live in Berlin, you know, which Germany in so many ways has been the oasis. I mean, the numbers this week are rising again, but by and large, right, the government has done a really good job containing the pandemic and you feel somewhat secure and it's a competent government as, you know, compared to, um, let's say the American one, right? And, and how they have dealt with the pandemic. So it's been really privileged. And for me personally, you know, despite all the suffering of other people, it's been actually a really shocking, but at the same time also exhilarating and intriguing and, and revealing experience. And so first of all, um, it has really, and many people have said that as well, it has really been sort of a decelerant that has slowed me down. And I had done, I, I've been traveling a lot for, for speaking engagements and business travel. And the pandemic has really forced me to come to terms with a smaller life and new essentialism. So I remember that I was going on walks during the lockdown here in Berlin, like the radical lockdown for several weeks, when I just walked the same path and went on the same tour every night and suddenly noticed things I'd never seen before because I was just distracted by my uh, frenzy, you know, frantic travel schedule. So it's been, it has brought all the big questions to the fore, business questions, societal questions, but also in the relationships, I think that you cultivate with your close ones or people who are on the periphery of your, of your social networks. And, um, you know, the pandemic on a broader level has been like a, a magnifying glass so this really shed light on some of the underlying structural issues and crises of our time, climate change, of course, uh, the first and foremost, but also social inequality, um, the erosion of the social contract um, and other and structural racism and other issues. But at the same time, it, is, it, it has also elevated us to the overview effect that astronauts report of when they are, when they look at earth, right, from, from outer space and suddenly they feel this humility and this, this responsibility for planet Earth in a way that they had never felt before in a very visceral, personal way. And I believe the pandemic has, has had a similar effect. We were zooming out and suddenly understood the bigger picture and how everything is interdependent and interrelates. And at the same time, it has really, uh, I mean, this is sort of pun intended, right? It's helped us zoom in quite literally and, and really question and examine every single aspect of our lives and scrutinize it and ask ourselves the question, is this the life I really want to lead? Is this the job I want to have? Is that the legacy that I want to leave behind? And it's been a real opportunity space. And I've seen a lot of initiatives and people transform and change lives and, and coming out of this, I mean, we're, well, we're still in the middle of it in many ways, um, but, but I think really changing the way they view the world. Now, there is a bit of disappointment. Um, there, there is a lot of mourning. One mourning, of course, and one grief is that we're grieving for a life that is lost. That I mean, not literally lost, that too, but but just sort of a sense of identity and concept of life that, that we will never be able to maintain. We know deep down inside that our lives are changing and we will have to live different lives. And of course, there's a lot of grief involved in that. But there's also some grief about the fact that this 
has been such an opportunity space. It could have been a pivotal moment for the species, a species moment as Krista Tippett from On Being called it. But have we really seized it, you know, or have we squandered it? Because I, I sense that we're now rushing back to a desired sense of normalcy and that the big questions have suddenly become more incremental, smaller questions again. That big space is suddenly a small space again. We're pragmatic again, driven by, by practical concerns. So I wonder if we've seized the, if, if we squandered the opportunity, squandered that liminal space. And I hope not. And, and I hope that we have the, the courage and the stamina to maintain that space and then really reshape our economies, our societies, and, and really drastically change things because we have to. I totally agree. I, I believe that um, many in our circles really have grasped the opportunity to not go back to normal, not business as usual, but to make a reset, to really take a deep look at, at how things are. I, I believe it's okay to, uh, to grieve, to have those moments where you're, you know, you're caught up in the Netflix or the prime uh, Amazon videos, the streaming, whatever, Disney Plus, and you, you know, you just say, oh, today's a, a chips and uh, rerun night or whatever. Uh, but there is this tremendous pause and opportunity, not only to reconnect with nature, but also do a reevaluation of the human zoos or the homes that we live in, how we've created those, how uh, they are for us, the type of life we have built for us, each other, because now we've got this zoomed in view, like you, like you uh, no pun intended, how, how you described it, of where we are 24 seven, kind of in a lockdown period. And we're really saying, wow, this is absolutely not the place I wanna be 24 seven, or I haven't designed it or created my life in the way that that's comfortable and some things have bubbled to the surface. So I truly believe that my, my hope is that the majority of people um, are, are really looking at the kind of how, how, how the World Economic Forum has, um, described it as the great reset or a way to really move forward as a collective awakening, a consciousness that we move into a much better vision of, of what our future could be and how uh, uh, the future of pandemics and, and world uh, unrest could, could look for all of us. The last time we saw each other was this year, actually, and, and uh, DLD in Munich. We didn't get a chat very long, just shortly in the hallway, say hello, and uh, I wish we would have had time to catch up. But actually, the year began for, I don't know if it was for you, but for me, it was really pivotal. It, was, it started with a bang, a lot of movement, a lot of actions, you know, the decade of action 2020, and, and a lot of movement, not only around the environment, but in uh, business is shifting more towards what you discuss in, in your book, The Business Romantic, but also in how they do business, the, the, the things that we've talked about in, in, in the past, about the humans of new work and, and things like that, where I was really hopeful and optimistic. I, optimistic. I still am. Um, do you see that now with the pandemic that's really gone down or that um, digging in that new hope and optimism has actually gotten stronger in the aspect of businesses and how we do business and how events are done? I mean, it's affected both of us because we do a lot of events. Yeah, I believe we're really at a crossroads and this is kind of like a juncture and as we come out of this this pandemic, hopefully at some point next next year, when we really uh, you know go back to uh, to the workplaces or to completely new workplaces, but I think the the choice that we have is on the one hand to now really double down on bottom line thinking, on pragmatism, on a new economism, and basically say you know all of those advancements that were made, purpose driven cultures more humane cultures and business, different sets of values, different KPI, different uh, metrics and performance indicators. That they are nice to have, but at this point in this moment of crisis, we really need to double down on what matters, which is the bottom line, because at the end of the day, that's, what paying, that's what's paying the bills, back to the basics. 
And those are always, so that's one choice. And I certainly see organizations go there in, I can't blame them, of course. You know, if you're a small, medium-sized enterprise, you're a family-run business, and you're just like struggling to survive, of course your instinct is to double down on the, on the basics and then not dwell on anything that does, may not appear mission critical right now, which is more like soft or unnecessary. Um, it worries me, though, because of course that will undermine our ability in the long term to actually build a more humane economy and build cultures of trust and innovation. And if anything, then history has shown us that in any crisis, whether that's the financial crash in 2008 or the dot-com crash, you know, 1999, 2000, that companies that kept investing in culture and in innovation and actually made big leaps, you know, Google to name one company that famously rose and emerged from the dot-com crash more resilient and was stronger than before because it kept investing in, in new products and Apple did as well. So I think there's something to be said from an economic, from a business perspective, not to just completely go back to this reductionist view and be super pragmatically focused on the bottom line, but actually no, continue with a much broader view of business. Um, but I think there's a real tension now and there's gonna be a real struggle. Um, so some of those um, fundamental um, market forces, they're gonna be, I think, reinforced and they're gonna uh, see new support and for a more humanist way of doing business uh, in, in the spirit of, for example, the, the CEO roundtable statement that came out last year and many companies changing their mission statements and changing the way they operate. Um, it's, I think they, they have to stick with their, uh, stick with their path. So uh, it's either a back to the basics or it's a real, it's, it's a license to reinvent business from the ground up, which I hope is, is the path that we'll take. But is that, that almost takes me down a, a rabbit hole there, um, which, I, which I'm not sure we want to go there yet, but I do want to just skim and touch, touch upon it uh, quickly. I believe the pause and the reset um, last year's last quarter, this year's first quarter, when we look from index of stocks and things is really telling um, because we have this tendency throughout history when we have a, a financial bu bubble, real estate bubble, some kind of economic bubble that when it bursts, it crashes, there's some issue with that that we do a bailout, we, we kind of go back to business as usual. You know, that's where the term, go back to the old system, that bubble burst and, and the, you know, nothing really changed in the system or the way we did it. Um, in the past, as, as I speak a lot about environmental, social governance, sustainability, you know, climate environment, and how we could shift our business models to one that's much more uh, in line with business romance, with sustainability, with this long-term way of doing things that's not only fun, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's very uh, enjoyable because of the people you get to do it with, the, the, the culture. During the, these last uh, two quarters, just from profit and return and investments, all those businesses that divested and, and, and changed their business model to, to environmental social governance, directions and inve investments and divestments, the sustainable development goals and their goals, all we have to do is look towards the NASDAQ, the New York Stock Exchange, the S&P 500, S&P Global, Stocks Europe, 600 Benchmark, Collier, Nikkei Index, Goldman Sachs, on and on and on, HB, uh, HSBC research reports during the first quarter, during the last quarter of last year, um, basically said sustainable index funds lost less than their conventional counterparts there and conventional index funds. So not only is the proof in the pudding, but seven out of 10 sustainability equity funds finished in the top halves of their Morningstar categories. That's 24 out of 26 environmental, social and governance funds. So the money is there that pause and reset also extended our earth overshoot day. Um, you know, we went from last year, July 29th to this year, 
to, to August 22nd. So we've gained 24 more days. And, and I, I could go on of some positive things. And I don't think they're, they're long enough to make a big, huge dent, but they're really good uh, examples for businesses that say, okay, let's go back to the way it was, or let's just try to salvage this. Say, no, no, there, there is a better business model. And it also weathered this pandemic. And, and it's actually looking even better in the second quarter as well, um, that, that it's proof that the, there are better operating systems out there that are really more human-centered, more consciousness, more worthy of the type of work we do and things, and also watch out for human health and, and our planet. And so uh, I, I, you touched on all of those things, and I'm hoping that through our work that we can educate those companies, those people to really say, hey, I know you need an answer to your chair or your board or whoever, the bottom line is important. Here's the proof, let's, let's make that shift, you know. Um, this is where I really wanna get into your book. So I've got the beautiful copy here that you signed and, and our picture together where you signed it for me. We met in Heiligen Damm. Oh, and, right, right, oh my and, God. And, and Heiligen Damm. 2015, uh, it must have yeah, been. Yeah, it was a while, yeah. a while mm -hmm. well, quite a while ago. And, um, you know, your book really changed and, and flipped a view along with other books that came out actually much later in your talks about how we look at work and how we have this romance and the, who, the people we work with and how we look at the that whole system that we actually give most of our time to work instead of those who we love and, and be with. And so I would like you to just maybe talk about, for those of, uh, of my listeners who haven't read your book, a little bit about that book and then tease us ab about what's coming out on Thursday in German and, and what will be coming out in English, hopefully very soon thereafter. And what the differences are and, and, and why and, and, and what's brought you to this point to go to the next step uh, on, on your journey. I've always been very interested in the, in the juxtaposition of two concepts that seem very much opposed to one another, you know, just opposite pairs that don't attract one another. And when I wrote the business romantic, it was business and romance, which seemed to be the opposite sides, you know, opposite poles. Um, and only few business people would have said of themselves that they're romantics. In fact, that was a derogatory term, right? That was commonly used in business to basically label as some, something as eccentric or not realistic, right? Don't romanticize, you're romantic about this. And it always kind of irked me. Um, and it irked me that I was the person in the meeting uh, and someone on the other side of the table had the data and was right because they had the data. Um, and having, a background in the in the humanities and the arts, I always felt very strongly that and and quasi objective truth that is data backed is only still part of the truth, but it's not the absolute truth. And there's so much more to life and to our understanding of the world that's more elusive, mysterious, that cannot be measured, that's not precise, that's not scientific, that is not quantifiable. And and I, I guess that that sentiment uh, really uh, galvanized working with frog design and I was working with a private equity firm which had acquired frog and I was working with the board members and it was a you know they had a very numbers driven ruthless numbers driven logic very smart people and yet so myopic in their view of, of business and that was the spark for me to then write the business romantic and what I'll try to do in the book which came out in 2015 is to look at the the romantic movement really of the 18th 19th century the, the poets, the philosophers, which emerged in response to the enlightenment and this idea of scientific rationality and said, no, there's the human soul is much more complex, right? And there is a subjective, very emotional, irrational side to it. And I got, became very intrigued by the parallels to this moment in time when the new enlightenment, if you will, is the new dataism is the new Silicon Valley idea of for every single problem, there is a software or data solution, right? You can engineer the world if you only have all the necessary information available. So the same sort of myopic trap that the enlightenment perhaps fell into 
and and humans are like a machine so you can optimize them and they get better and better and better and can eventually overcome themselves and so the business romantic was really a, a manifesto against that view and drew from romanticism saying like actually what we need is a counter movement we need another romantic re revolution very much in the same way that the romantics revolted against the enlightenment now with business romantics revolting against this very reductionist simplified view of humans that the digital platforms were were promoting and uh, and i looked at all the principles of making meaning in business and i realized that to me at least they were all romantic principles so mystery intimacy um serendipity um, a, an unconditional um commitment to things passion right the idea of a labor of love so i was looking at all of these tropes and then converted them into into um principles of of you know running a business or leadership and it's interesting because when i wrote the book into in 2014 it came out in 2015 it was very much a book about humanism. And at the end of the day, it was about a book that was driven by this idea of being human centered. And I had never been really very much attuned to nature. I'm a total city boy. And I remember that I spoke at a conference in, uh, in South Carolina uh, at some point, I think it was New Year's. And I could talk about business romanticism and someone came to me after the talk and said, you know, this is so interesting. There's one really glaring omission in everything you were just talking about, with which I wholeheartedly agree, but there's some some really noticeable omission, which is you never talk about nature and the communion with nature, the relationship to nature and finding ourselves as in nature and understanding humans as a part of nature is was such a crucial, was such an essential element of romanticism, right? It, they almost like mystify nature and and, um, and, and celebrate that this communion with nature. And it, it's interesting, and I've been sort of thinking about this for years, and just recently, because of the pandemic, and many other people shared the same experience with me, it, I think it just began, I began to realize, like, you know, how, how alienated I had been from nature. And I had a few experiences just in the few months where I felt like, like finally, I've sort of uh, um, found my own, you know, I be I'm beginning to develop my own relationship with nature. And now what is interesting and, and that's maybe the segue to my new book about losing, uh, is that I actually believe human-centered is, is really over. In many ways, that's the problem. We don't need more human-centered design or a, a human-centered way of running business, which in so many ways got then reduced to convenient, efficient, right, um, comfortable. But what we really need are businesses that have uh, what Casper de Kuhl uh, called soul-centered or what some label as planetary boundaries or planetary well-being or an animist uh, view of the world, right? Where you recognize that everything, every animal, every living thing has a soul and has a spirit that we need to honor. And we're just part of a much bigger ecosystem. And I think that's kind of interesting. And, and, and that's also what I'm trying to explore with the book about losing, that we are in a time now where it's becomingly clear what we're at risk of losing if winning which was sort of the, the engine behind growth, right? On the psychological level, if winning is the only option, we lose everything, including our planet, we lose everything. And this is why it's important that we shift away from the Anthropocene, you know, the human at the center, at the, as the center of all things, to what the German philosopher Tobias Ries, I just read a really fascinating essay by his, calls the microbiocene. So realizing because of the pandemic and the virus, that the virus is us, it's in us. In fact, it's part of evolution. It's how we actually progress. We can no longer separate ourselves and differentiate ourselves. He calls it the great undifferentiation uh, when he talks about the pandemic. We can no longer differentiate ourselves from nature. We're one. And so the question is not so much how do we humanize business? The question is actually, how do we biologize, naturalize, ecologize business, right? That's the much more pressing question. And that goes hand in hand with another technological development that is quite intriguing that I'm just beginning to wrap my head around, which is the emergence of what uh, some people call deep tech, right? Synthetic biology, uh, co-design with nature, uh, biomimicry, right? Basically no longer just studying nature to then design in a human-centered way, but actually co-designing with nature in a symbiotic fashion. 
Um, and if you combine those two trends, so here you have like the move away from the, from the, the human centrism, the Anthropocene, a new humility, if you will. And then there is this interesting technological development, this intertwining of, of nature and human agenda in the way we run business and create products and services. And then you have, I think, a whole new playing field. So it's a mindset change, it's a technological change, but it's also a business model change, which goes beyond, I believe, the doing well by doing good, or more traditional notions of sustainability, um, or this idea of like, hey, we have to humanize business by making it more amenable and more convenient for humans. Um, so I think that's the next radical shift. Um, and that's part of what I'm exploring with uh, in, in the book, The End of Winning or Against the Dicta Dictatorship of, of Winners, which is coming out in Germany this week. That was a long answer to your question. No, that, that's perfect. Fine. <laughs> I'm, I'm so glad to hear it. It's, it's so beautiful because a lot of the things you're saying are th also things that I talk about. I, I often talk about a symbiotic earth and that we, um, matter of fact, last year I was in Songdo, Korea, the United Nations NAP Expo doing the next iteration after the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals, which possibly will be the Resilience Frontiers or Resilience Goals. And at that uh, five-day event, this conference uh, expo, uh, Professor Chin spoke and he says, we need to evolve from Homo sapiens to Homo symbiose. So as an integral part of, of our world, our planet, the, you know, this is our World Bank. Our World Bank is not some physical structure or location uh, it, it is uh, our world it's where we get all our resources but the biome of our planet is integrally tied to the biome of our gut and our body and who we are and they are really one and if our biome of our earth is doing bad guaranteed the biome of humanity will be doing bad as well and ha have problems because those viruses live in us, those microorganisms live in us. Um, I just also think it's so pinnacle that your book came out in 2015, which was an actual year where there was a huge shift in all sorts of ways of viewing the world, not only the Paris agenda and, and, and SDGs and, and many other shifts in consciousness, awareness towards food or biome and planet, and that you really provided some new lenses to view how we're operating, what we're doing, how, how, how we're acting in our daily lives. And, and we can touch upon this later, how the romantic society and the other things that, that evolved out of that, that kind of another movement in and of itself, to, and how uh, you, I mentioned in your biography that it was in Lisbon, um, during the same time as the Web Summit, where what 70,000 people or more uh, were there for Web Summit, but the who's who of business leaders were at your event, the Romantic Society, Business Romantic Society event that you, that you held there, and you can maybe touch on what an event like that looks like, because they are also seeing, man, we need to make a shift, we need to make some changes, and I need to surround my pe myself with with people who are in line with this, instead of being in, in, at an event with 70,000 people all trying to pitch and sell me something that has no value to, to save humanity or to do business in a different way, you know? Um, so I love that, but, but I, I'd like you to touch on that first. And then I wanna go back still, I wanna uh, not only talk about my slaughtering the new name of uh, your German, your, your book first in German in English and, and what that kind of addresses as well. But first I'd like you to touch a little bit more on, on that shift in the Romantic society as well. So whenever the, there are these big epic shifts in, in society or in, in business, I believe there's always a, a three stage process. So leaders, myself included, First of all, there is a, there's heartbeats or there is an unarticulated desire for something, right? There's an itching, but you don't really know. You can't put your finger on it. You don't really know what it is. And there's no new narrative yet. There's no promised land even. It's just this desire, this, this nebulous desire for something that is different from what you're doing today. And then the next step is really to craft new language. So I think the next thing that happens and that, that people like you and I can, can then, uh, in a modest way, 
do is, is to provide new lenses, new frames, new language, or rehabilitate language like romantic that had been neglected or had been moved out of business and move it back in so that the playing field gets bigger again and new possibilities open. So the language and the narrative and the story is really important. And that's what I did with the book to some degree. I was trying to do in a, in a, with a business romantic, but then I also felt, and this is the feedback that I got from readers that they said, well, the third step in this journey, of course, is the embodiment. So this is all nice and the language inspires, but what we'd love to see now, what I really wanted to do now then as well was to give it a, give it a container, give it a form um, and, and embody it. And the best way to embody something, of course, at least for me, was to, to hold a gathering, to literally create a space. My, my friend and actually one of our board members, Jean-Pierre Petlieri, uh, he's a professor at INSEAD in, in France. He once said, you know, any vision is always a space and any space is always a vision. So if, if you have a vision of the future of the world, like you, you inadvertently you think of a, of a promised land or a house or a beach or a forest or, or a city. In our case, it was really a house. We wanted to create a house that, that whose doors were open and you walk through them and it would do something to you. And in that house, you could find a new version of doing business in a, in a very playful way. You could go into one room and, and find out what intimacy, social intimacy might look like at the workplace. You go to another room and you could learn about blockchain and something very practical, blockchain and, inc and inclusive growth. You go to a third room, and it was a music studio and people who learned to listen and by learning to listen, to collaborate better and become better leaders. So it was this house of opportunity and it, it really provided managers and freelancers and academics and CEOs with an opportunity to play, to, to, to play and to maybe try on a new identity, try on a new concept, um, even without really realizing all of the consequences, but just in a playful way, and then return after this, this very often very intense emotional experience, return to their workplace, to their team, to their organization, and at least be inspired enough to say, okay, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna change something. And that, that's, that's really why we created what we called the House of Beautiful Business in 2017. We've now held uh, four annual gatherings in Lisbon, and it's grown organically and is now really a global think tank and community with the goal to, to make business more beautiful. And again, you have there this juxtaposition of business and beautiful, how do the two belong together? But that's exactly the point, that we wanna play with this tension and wanna leave enough space for interpretation without providing an in, in, you know, uh, ultimate distinctive definition, a de definitive definition of that. Um, and now, of course, the pandemic has also completely disrupted our plans to do in-person in -person gatherings. And this year, we, are, we decided in June basically to pivot and host a, a gathering, which is something completely new to us and probably for a lot of people. It's a hybrid festival over four days that will have an in-person component. There'll be 30 local hubs in cities worldwide, from Melbourne to uh, Hong Kong to Sao Paulo to Toronto. Uh, to Johannesburg, but there's also, of course, you know, an online programming, but the online programming is beyond Zoom. It includes WhatsApp and many other uh, inner work assignments, many other channels. And the idea is really that we bring thousands of people together uh, who are pursuing the same vision and dream and want to get toes into this new way of doing business, these big shifts that we talked about earlier but do it in a very experiential way and connect them all, even though they don't have to be literally connected digitally all the time. It's just like the sense, the spirit that connects them all. So it's a decentralized hybrid festival, a journey over four days. And the name of it is The Great Wave, which is really bizarre because we chose that name in December last year. We said, okay, that's, we, we sort of had the sense that 2020, and you alluded to that earlier as well, was going to be this epic year and there were some real, um, momentous changes afoot. Of course, we didn't know, you know, that that would be the pandemic and we had no idea what was going to unfold, but we had the sense that something big was going to happen. It's also the year of the U.S. presidential election, of course, in, in November. And, and now, and this goes back to what I said earlier about nature, in a, in a weird way, it's for us, it all is making sense. It's all coming together. So we had to surrender to the great wave. It had sort of assumed a power that we were no longer able to stop, suddenly became 
this global event and we had to change and we had to sort of give in. Um, so in a, in a strange and very beautiful way, it, it kind of showed us the way. Uh, where to go and uh, so the, the event is from October 16th to 19th and we're, we're equally excited and terrified because it's really a massive experiment uh, anyway but yeah that's the story of the House of Beautiful Business from its origins to what we're now setting out to do in the fall and I'll, I'll include a link on the show notes so people can go and check that out and, and I'm sure you have enough information on how to get involved and be part of that as well um, the new book, um, so in the German version, uh, Dictatorship, How to Lose Without Being a Loser, my poor translation, you know, how to win against dictatorships, and I'm sure the English version is called something totally different, but just in the name itself, the German, for me as an, as an American who speaks German, it's, it's kind of like, this current civilization frameworks that we have are not working for us anymore. Uh, there's kind of this, this you know, fail fast, uh, uh, um, but how can you fail and still be a winner or not be a loser type of a, a thing? Those are images that kind of bubble to my mind, but I'd really like to hear from you what it is and, and uh, is it tied a little bit to these uh, civilization frameworks that are no work, no longer working for humanity in some respects? Yeah, it, it, it's really funny how times are changing. When I when I first told my agent about this idea to write this book uh, two or three years ago, or two years ago, you know, I mean, she said it's a really interesting topic, but just make sure you don't put uh, losing on the cover or <laughs> winning. No one's going to buy that book. And, and also specifically in America, and actually a, a friend of mine just told me after reading an essay about the book, she said, that's the most un-American un essay I've ever read. <laughs> the, the end of winning, you know, that is a very un-American idea. And in many ways, I guess it's very European and very German. So it's very heavy. Uh, but now I think it's changing because now through the pandemic and through everything that we've come to realize, I think we're all ready to have a conversation about, about losing. And we are realizing that we've applied this, this binary framework, dividing the world and ourselves and members of society into winners or losers, whether we like it or not, even in the most progressive liberal society. At the end of the day, yes, you can fail. And I distinguish failing and failing fast from losing in the book. But failing is a dramatic event. You can recover uh, in some cultures, such as the American one. It's a badge of honor. If you fail with a startup and you try another one, you become better. You learn from your failure. But losing is a much more, it's almost like the sand slipping through your fingers. It's permanent, irrational anxiety that is with you. It's a fear of losing face, of losing control, of losing status, influence, power, material, uh, wealth as well. And I think that's the ultimate fear that you no longer belong. And of course, essentially, that's a fear of our own mortality, right? That we don't win, that we don't, we, we are not covering up, right? For the very basic insight that, yes, we're incredibly fragile and we are going to lose and we're all losing all the time, every tiny second bit, uh, bit of our lives. So what I'm trying to do with the book is to proclaim the end of winning, that, that this framework that was so obsessed with winning for the sake of winning at the expense of everything else. I mean, look at Trump, right? This, uh, it's interesting that Trump promised uh, Americans, we're gonna win so much, we're gonna get tired of winning. And everybody else who's not with him is, is not, uh, is not uh, you know, uh, any other sort of in, in insulting remark. No, loser, loser is the ultimate insult. Um, and I think it's really interesting. Um, and so that's really the ultimate fear. And what I'm trying to do with the book is to, to establish a culture of losing, not just a culture of failing fast, but a culture of losing, arguing that the, this obsession with winning has produced too many externalities, right? The, obviously, the, the climate, the planet is one but it also has increased social inequality. It has increased dramatic increases in mental uh, health uh, issues worldwide. Um, and it has also led, if you look at the digital economy, it has led to a real threat, right? That, that we're abdicating to AI and that there is this super optimization machine that is threatening our human agency. 
And then there's the new humility that, that I spoke about earlier. It's sort of this realization that maybe we're not in control. Maybe we've lost control. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe we have to become more humble and see ourselves more as an integral part of nature. Uh, the end of human-centered design. So all of these, these themes I explore and I'm trying to then find, I, I examine stories of losers and losing from death of a salesman, uh, Arthur Miller's play to um, uh, Romeo and Juliet or Hamlet in, in traditional literature, Shakespeare, um, to more recent stories of losing. And, and I'm trying to then develop what I call strategies for losers. So very provocatively establishing losing is something that we need to embrace. And that is not a stigma, but rather a quality, especially for, for people at work uh, who have to reinvent themselves and become more resilient, uh, even, uh, I mean, even more so than, than ever before. And so there are strategies for losers on the societal level, on the organizational level at the workplace, but also on the personal level. And a lot of them have to do with rituals or, or practices that we can muster that just help us become more comfortable, not again with, with a failed project, uh, that too, but with this real um, basic acceptance of the fact that losing is part of our life and we shouldn't stigmatize it. Yeah, it's a really a part of uh, learning as well. If you don't fall down and and get back up, you're, you know, it's that, that, that learning process is really big. There's another one, and this may be going down a rabbit hole, and I don't want to um, tease or release your book before it comes out and give too much information away, but there's, there's this thing. You, you, we talked about symbiotic earth before and about the nature, but really what you're saying is, Neo-Darwinism, neoliberalism, survival of the fittest, only the strong survive, natural selection, severe competition, that uh, that's how the world works. Well, that's bullshit. The world does not work like that. It's about cooperation and collaboration, and it's about failing and learning from your mistakes that we, we have this, this uh, fierce battle of freedom and winning and, and, and this, and that's not how our world works. Our world really works uh, as a symbiotic earth in nature and harmony with a lot of collaboration and cooperation. And I see that in some of the things you just mentioned kind of naturally coming out, which is probably the deeper core, you know, you're addressing, you know, there is no neoliberalism, no neo-Darwinism. Our world functions in a much different way. And so you're putting a different type of not spin is probably not the right word but a, a voice or narrative on how we can view it a little bit different and understand you know that old way that we were doing it or the way that we thought was right is actually probably the one that's holding us back the most or keeping us from getting where we really want to be I actually was going to ask you about that because you know much more about those uh, natural processes and you know uh, uh, biology <laughs> than, than I do, because, because I had the same thought when I wrote the book that, it, you know, and I read this from other experts as well, right, that uh, um, competition, yes, is an element of nature, but it's superseded basically by cooperation or co-opetition at least. So c can you give me some examples? I'm just curious to, to well, yeah, well, the, I mean, the principle of winning debunked by, by nature. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the real um, really um, bubbled to the surface with uh, Carl Sagan's wife, which is, is really, it's really neat how it ties in because you, know, you talk about the overview effect and how, how we see our planet from outer space. And, and, and Carl Sagan was an astronomer big on space, but his first wife was Lynn Mar Margulis. She is one of the pioneering women in science and also in, in not only biome, microbiology, and she coined the term symbiotic earth and that uh, found mycorrhiza and this uh, mycelium uh, uh, connectedness of soil and our biome, that type of thing. But she was also the biggest proponent against uh, Dawkins and many other scientists. Um, she did a lot with um, uh, Jim Lovelock, James Lovelock, who, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the Gaia mm -hmm. principle and things like that. And they, they collaborated a lot in, in different ways. But she was like the, the, the lone ranger, the wonder woman in science that went up against all these male figures who were really pushing and promoting 
neoliberalism and neo-Darwinism saying that it's survival of the fittest natural selection. And she said, no, actually it's not like that. It's through the mycelium, the mycorrhiza. Our world is, was began for, if you look at the timeline of the earth, the birth till of our earth till now, not only we're we all made up of star stuff like Carl Sagan said, but our earth begins with bacteria, microorganisms, and we evolved out of this primordial soup. And, and in 2015, that pinnacle year was the year that on the bacteria tree of life, we discovered a whole section um, that all has to do with our gut health, with, gut health with the, the microbes, the microbial genes, the microbial cells, all in our body that we didn't know about in the beginning. And that all comes really from the work of Lynn Margulis and this whole thinking of, of a symbiotic earth and really the pushing off that w was really instigated through um, corporates and organizations kind of pushing that on those scientists to say, you know, it's this competition, severe competition, we must win. And, and it's okay if you don't, but if you look at anywhere in nature, whether it's birds or, or uh, snakes hatching out of an egg or whatever it is, um, none of that is reality. It's all uh, the symbiotic um, symbiose evolving. And so I, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's kind of where this yeah, thought process is. It's pretty old mm -hmm. and, and it's also uh, really tied deeply to, to our, the big history our big history. And so that you have not only with the business romantic and, and uh, your new book and those things that you're really getting the narratives, the lenses for lay people, for everyday people to, and business people to say, Hey, you know, that's right. And here, here's this other way of doing things. I, I just love that. It just is, is amazing because you don't really need to know all that science. It's great to know it and have all the facts <laughs> and not. graphs and, 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 and figures, but the reality is it just works. It, it's really how, how life works and how we go forward. I mean, it's been proven in the data, in the science, in the big history, that that's a better way of doing things. Um, and, and the biggest, the busy, biggest example, and then I'll, I'll shut up and we'll get back into some, some deeper things of, of this whole thing is we have more than 12 civilizations on, on this earth that no longer exist. Uh, early antiquity, Mesopotamia, Incas, Aztecs, Mayas, uh, Romans, Greeks, and, and more than 12 of them don't exist uh, because of ecological or environmental collapse. Only two of them don't exist because some kind of a conflict, conflict or, or boundary uh, changes, um, some other uh, non-ecological environmental collapses. But it's all kind of in line that, you know, it's time for that new awakening, that shift, that new model, because the, that old one is either going to become a mythology, a, a ruin of, of a civilization that doesn't exist if we don't continue that evolution to where it needs to go, which also ties to neo-Darwinism and, and, and neoliberalism and, 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 and it ties to that, that other way of thinking. So. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you. And are you, um, if I may ask you another sure, sure. The, you know, you, you may have read uh, Jonathan Franzen's very controversial essay in the New Yorker last year, where he said basically uh, American author, uh, and, and likewise, Paula, Paula Antonelli had this uh, exhibition, Broken Nature, where she said, basically, the only thing we can design for is a beautiful ending, but we have to accept that the ending is near. Um, and Franzen similarly was saying, we have to stop fooling ourselves because climate change is irreversible at this point, and there's absolutely no indication that humans are able to change the behavior at such scale that we can still prevent it from happening. So rather than directing or allocating resources on combating climate change, we should think about how to live with uh, climate change. And he was particularly keen on heralding the power of community. So, and it was very, um, it was a very controversial essay because it was, of course, it's very provocative and some people accused him of defeatist attitudes and, and, and cynicism. And I'm just curious to, I'm, I'm curious to, to hear your perspective as someone who is 
um, you know, speaking about these topics uh, and, and an expert, how optimistic are you? And if this civilization is indeed uh, going to, to die, um, is that in the grand scheme of things such a bad thing? Well, I'm, I'm very hopeful and optimistic, the, sh the short version. I, be I believe in humanity. I believe we can shift on a dime. Uh, we've, we've shown it during this pandemic that we can shift and change on a dime and pivot and create amazing things and, and, and do things. But we've also seen big history in the past how some, um, uh, sadly, mainly from the United States, uh, we've seen that, that some amazing things are uh, possible during during times of, of conflict or collapse or, or deep troubles that, that we can rise above. The other thing is I really believe in the exponential function. I understand it. And I believe there is a window of time. We are on the, we need to uh, um, realize we have to take that exponential roadmap. But the more we hit that critical mass of people who not only believe and understand and have that optimism, but more so take action daily in their lives. And it's actually a, a better type of an action. The way we, we live our lives is actually nicer. It's a more romantic. It's more enjoyable and connected with nature that those shifts are also ones that really can hit that critical mass, uh, get us on the exponential curve where we can truly reach all, not only the, the 17 sustainable development goals, the targets, indicators, the monies, the transitions, transformations needed to, to get there. Uh, there's a lot of education, enlightenment, awareness, and, and reaching that critical mass so that we can make, uh, make that moment happen. The thing, that I do know, and I, and I agree with, I, I, I've uh, heard both of those views, and um, there's always something to someone else's view, and they need to be regarded and, and thought out of. So a lot of humanity is waiting for the future to happen for them. They're not creating it, they're not uh, doing that, and uh, that's gonna be a disappointing thing if you're waiting for the future to happen to you. It's like having a ship uh, without a plan or a course or a rudder. It's like having a uh, driving a vehicle without knowing where you're going. You're really only going somewhere slower in the wrong direction and you're not going in the direction that you desire that where you want to see yourself in the future. I, I absolutely do. And it's probably too long of a discussion to get into how and what and why we need to do that. Um, humanity w will die, but it, we're, we're talking um, hundreds of millions of years to, to billions of years um, in, in a sustainable, resilient type of a operating system, a model for the earth. If we continue on the path that we have and that enlightenment, awakening, and that change doesn't happen, it will be a lot sooner. In death, I must say, there is a lot of joy, hope, and optimism because in death, there is a rebirth and it brings a lot new life and and things uh, to our world. Uh, we're breathing the same air that Gandhi breathed. We're breathing and drinking the same air that they have in China and the same waters that they have in China because we're all on the same planet, you know? And um, uh, I that don't makes know if me, that answered your question, that, but that I hope- That does <laughs> answer my question. It makes me very hopeful hearing this from you and I agree. And I, I think that's the right the right attitude, but I, I think it is interesting to, as you said, to regard other views and they, they challenge and in many ways solidify, I guess, a case for optimism as well. Mark, I think I have to go because um, we had scheduled an hour and my daughter is claiming <laughs> she has a, or did you want to continue for a few minutes? I don't want to abruptly leave, but I just want to give you a heads up that I can I get, to make space. <laughs> can I get two more questions? Sure, of course. I would yeah. appreciate it. We could actually talk for hours because um, uh, honestly, there's so much to go into. We haven't even hit my, my major questions, but I'm going to ask um, three of them. I'm going to try to do it quick and it depends <laughs> on your answer and I won't make, I'll any, keep my answer short. I won't make any commentaries. Um, the first one is, do you feel like you're a global citizen? And as if you do, as a global citizen or as a human being, can you envision a future without nations, borders, divisions of humanity? I 
cannot. Okay. Um, I, uh, I am a global citizen. I am a, a German and an American citizen. And I remember when I was sworn in uh, as an American citizen because of marriage to, to an American uh, woman, um, there were a hundred nationalities with me during that day, during the ceremony. I was quite moved to see that diversity in, um, in, in you know, a citizenship nationality, but at the same time also like how global that is. Um, so I, yeah, I believe in global citizenry and I think we share a lot of values as a species and as humanity and um, nations are not terribly important to me. At the same time, I think we should not underestimate the power of the nation state and national identity. We've seen this with the pandemic as well. Like, you know, at the end of the day, how do you um, define yourself? Who do you identify with? It's, it's, is it your neighborhood? Yes. It's your city? Yes. But during the pandemic, I think we've seen that uh, national identities should not be discredited quite yet. You know, they matter. Um, and I'm not opposed to the view. I, I like borders, uh, boundaries. I think they, they give us identity. Uh, identity is always a question of, uh, you know, if everybody's family is my friend Priya Parker once said, then no one is family. So um, I think it's, it's important to, to um, also exclude and include so that those are meaningful actions. I think we just have to do it in a very um, mindful way to not marginalize and to not uh, shut down and, and uh, disadvantage, of course, uh, many, many um, populations. But I think borders and boundaries um, are not always a sign of division or of strife. They can be meaningful distinctions and actually enhance diversity. So in that sense, uh, I don't necessarily see a view where borders will fall and it's going to be one collective tribe that is uh, with, with a lot of distinctions, uh, you know, leveled out. I don't see that yet. Thank you. I, I, we could dive down several rabbit holes for that question alone, but it's good to hear, hear your point and, and views on that. And maybe we'll have to pick that up in another discussion. Um, the, the next question is the burning question, WTF, and it's not the swear word, it's what's the future? And I'm talking about the future for you. <laughs> I would say WTF, because I have no idea. Um, because, you know, I've always had a pretty good idea of what's to come in the next year and where I would like to be and how I would, my place in the world and what I could do. I think I do know that. I think through the House of Beautiful Business, I've, this has been kind of like a calling or a family sort of came home and it's been a real arrival of sorts. Like I found my tribe, I found my, my role. But because of the pandemic and the whole volatility that we've experienced over the past six months or so, I can't even think beyond the great wave. It's also because I'm so focused on executing this event that is in front of us, but I can't even think beyond October. I have no idea what the world will look like next year. It, you know, it could be very dystopian. It, it could be really a, a beautifully reset world. I, in so many ways, the US presidential election, of course, are gonna be a bellwether. You know, they are super important. They're gonna change a lot of things. The outcome will change a lot of things. I really don't know. And you know what? That is really great. <laughs> I love that the future, not just mine, but our future has maybe become a little bit less predictable than it was four or five years ago. Um, that's scary, but, it, but it's also liberating. That's it's nice to hear. Yeah. I've, I've, <laughs> never, I've never heard that view before, but thank you for sharing that. And the last thing I have, and then I'll let you go, is if um, you were to share one takeaway, one sustainable takeaway to my listeners, something that would empower them or make their lives better of you or something that they should adopt, could you kind of give us a kind of a free tease or wisdom of a learning from, from Tim and, and uh, what they could apply or do or what may, might make their lives better if they're an inventor, entrepreneur, or whoever? I would say um, embrace intimacy. If, if there's one thing I've realized over the past few years is there's this beautiful quote by Richard Bach who said, the opposite of loneliness is not being together or connected, it's intimacy. 
uh, emotional intimacy and or intimacy in all of its various shades and forms but intimacy is something that is uniquely human machines cannot be intimate because they 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 can suffer and suffering the ability to suffer the ability to be vulnerable it makes us or gives us the ability to also develop intimacy so it's such a uniquely human experience and if you dare being intimate on so many levels with your uh, you know emotionally intimate with your colleagues your friends strangers um, objects nature right i think you'll have a much more fulfilled life and you will develop a tenderness and a sense of care that we as a collective desperately need but that will also make your life better even though it comes at a greater risk to pursue intimacy than convenience or other you know qualities that you might want to pursue but ultimately it's more fulfilling so that's something that that i'm not always good um but i i've come to realize that that's a really something i want to nurture Thank you so much, Tim. And that's been a sure pleasure. We could talk Thank for you. hours just so <laughs> much. Please have a good day and, and, and greet your daughter. I want a signed copy of the new book when it comes out. Please uh, know that in advance. I'll pay for it. But you, uh, if you'll give me a signed copy and uh, I, I look forward to it. And I hope my listeners uh, get it because I know it will be great learnings. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day, Tim. Thank you so much, Mark. It's been a pleasure. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.